Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to a talk on election 2016. I don't know how many of you watched the, one of the very first debates last night, uh, but Labor Day marks the beginning of the electoral season. So we had the debate last night, and then we have the first official debate coming up on September 26th, town hall meeting October 9th, and the second debate on October 19th. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background to prepare you for the election 2016, which I believe is probably the most important presidential election in American history. And I will give you the reasons why I think that um, right now. Well, the outline for today's talk is first going to talk about the American century, how this is playing out today in the elections. The situation in the world today, a world of crisis. And then thirdly, Donald Trump, the eternal outsider. And finally, Hillary Clinton, the eternal insider. The American century was, the term was coined by um, Henry Luce in Time magazine in 1941. As the United States was in the middle of World War II, Luce wrote that following the war, the United States would emerge as the leading world power, which was not at all obvious in 1941, with Japan and Italy and uh, Nazi Germany claiming preeminence in the world. It was a sort of a stretch of the imagination. But Luce argued that the goal of American history, beginning at the founding of the 13 colonies, through independence, the growth, the Civil War, World War I, and now finally World War II, that this was all laying the groundwork for an American century, when the United States would be the new Roman Empire and would rule the world. This was called the Pax Americana, the age of American domination when the world would exist in peace. The United States clearly was the world's superpower. Here we see the slide with NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, linking the United States and Canada and most of the countries of Western Europe, initially West Germany, today expanding into the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, Turkey, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Britain, Iceland, Norway. This was to solidify the American military domination of the world. And after the war, we had the atomic bomb. We used the atomic bomb. The American dollar was the international currency. The World Bank ensured that the dollar would remain supreme and that the United States would have veto power over the economies of the world. So economically and politically, we were number one. Culturally, after the war, the United States dominated the world. Whether it was Hollywood movies, Coca-Cola, Time magazine, writers such as Stephen King, uh, uh, Adidas, American baseball. This was world culture. And I was very much a part of that as a, an English teacher. Wherever I went in the world, from Asia to Africa, South America, everybody wanted to learn English. It had become the world's language, much like Latin was during the Roman Empire. Politically, the United States dominated the world. Through the Security Council at the United Nations, we had the veto power, and the only other country which was unfriendly to us was the Soviet Union. But yet, the bulk of the countries of the General Assembly were either American allies or American puppets. Iran was dominated by the Shah, who we overthrew the government, put in our friendly dictator. Uh, and it was really the um, age of America, from the Philippines to Europe to South America. American dictators ruled the planet. 
So this was not just an accident in American history, writers like Henry Luce wrote, but this was the culmination of American destiny. We had achieved our century of glory. Manifest destiny, which spurred the 13 colonies across the continent to the Pacific and onward to Alaska and Hawaii, carving out our colonies in the Philippines, economic domination as well. This was the culmination of the American dream. The American way of life. Everybody wanted a house in the suburbs. American movies and television shows proclaimed the American way of life to the world. The American dream had become a reality. We were spreading democracy. We were spreading American freedom. The American Constitution became the model for the constitutions of the new countries of Asia and Africa. American wealth was unrivaled. The dollar was omnipotent. And we were the policemen of the world. So this was the American century, which most American analysts would say was by the grace of God. Will Herberg's uh, famous book, Cath Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, proclaimed that American greatness sat on a three-legged stool, that it was one leg was Protestant, the other one was Catholic, and the third one was Judaism, that American glory, greatness, and prosperity was based on our firm religious foundation. People like Billy Graham spread the gospel of American greatness around the world. And don't forget, it was under President Eisenhower, right after the war, that we added, in God we trust, to the American currency. And we added the words, one nation under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance to show that American greatness was our divine destiny. Well, when you listen to Donald Trump, one of his main campaign slogans, Make America Great Again, which implies that we were great once, but we have fallen from that pedestal that we are no longer the number one country in the world, and Donald Trump aims to return us to this age of American greatness, that the American century is still ongoing. Even Hillary reflects this when she says that we will remain the number one power in the world. In fact, her words were, we are still great when she rebuked Donald Trump for claiming that we had lost our greatness. So this goal of American history, American greatness, is really um, being reflected in the pre presidential campaign today. It is one of the major themes that we constantly hear being repeated. We are great and we must restore or retain that greatness. Well, what is undermining this greatness? Well, both Hillary and Donald, when they look around the world, they see the United States being attacked on all sides by enemies. And this decline is generally viewed to have been our defeat in Vietnam. The old adage is withdraw and proclaim victory, as George Bush did in Iraq. Well, in Vietnam, we withdrew, but everybody knew it was in defeat. And the Vietnam War divided Americans. Should we be in the war or not? I was in college during the great protests against the Vietnam War. I was even in ROTC for the first semester until my college up in Erie, Pennsylvania, gave in to pressure from the students and banished the ROTC from the campuses. But America was bitterly divided over the war. And in the center panel here, we see the evacuation of the American embassy, where all of these South Vietnamese who had worked with us or collaborated with us 
were being flown out of the country. One of the most humiliating events in American history. And we see the Washington Post, Saigon surrenders. It was a defeat. And many people argue, Donald Trump would argue, and probably Hillary would agree, that this was a major crisis in the American confidence in itself. Social chaos, not only against the war in Vietnam, but regarding many other issues in the United States, sorely divided Americans into two camps. The abortion on demand, as they call it, which began here in New York City and spread throughout the country, even involving the Supreme Court, was viewed as a severe blow to American moral standing. Those who supported abortion rights of women and those who opposed it as being outright murder severely di d divided not only the American population but churches, women's groups, and other groups. The whole civil rights movement overcoming the legacy of racism and Ku Klux Klan divided Americans, not only black and white, but the supporters of the civil rights movement. And of course, the murder of Martin Luther King, the murder of Malcolm X, was a major blow to American self-esteem because we realized that all these glorious words that were enshrined in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution, as far as African Americans were concerned, were empty words. The movement of a Native Americans to just to rectify all of the injustices done to them was another blow to American self-esteem. We were not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We were the land that enslaved and persecuted African Americans, banished American Indians to reservations. The women's movement was also a major stumbling block in this American attitude of we are right, we are morally superior, where women were barred by the glass ceiling, by various forms of discrimination in economics, in cultural life, and in political life. And finally, the whole gay movement, which continues to divide Americans, and it's not only gay liberation, but things like gay marriage, adoption, continue to divide Americans into two hostile and competing camps. Another major problem that has been troubling Americans recently is immigration. 1969, the Hart Seller Immigration Reform Act threw open the doors of immigration to millions of Hispanics, Chinese, Indians, Africans, Arabs, Muslims, bringing them into a country which had previously been a predominantly white Northern European country. Samuel P. Huntington, my old professor at Harvard, wrote a wonderful book, Who Are We?, claiming that the melting pot had come to an end, that the Hispanics and the Chinese and the Muslims refused to melt, and it was becoming more of a salad bowl rather than the melting pot where we would all become Americans. And until today, we see that whole thing of building walls to keep out Hispanics, banning Muslim immigrants as a major theme in the political um, debate today. Another blow to American self-esteem was, of course, September 11, which I watched from the Queensboro Bridge linking Manhattan and Queens, uh, watching the towers collapse. That was the first major attack on the American homeland, something that even Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini could not accomplish. A small band of Muslims were able to. And of course, following that, that psychological shattering experience of September 11, the United States responded with the Afghan the War of Afghanistan, which had some justification, but George Bush expanded it into 
the Iraq War, waterboarding, torture, war crimes, Guantanamo Bay, overthrowing the elected, democratically elected government in Egypt and putting in the dictator Morsi to, uh, uh, Sisi today, the war in Libya, overthrowing the dictator and introducing chaos, American bombing campaigns in Somalia, the coup in Algeria, and ongoing terrorism, to say nothing of the Taliban and ISIS, which are continuing to shatter American self-confidence. This so-called war against terrorism is gradually and rapidly morphing into a war against Islam as we see Donald Trump saying, keep Muslims out of the United States. So we defeat Al-Qaeda. Well, then comes ISIS, Boko Haram. What is going to be the next attack on America? Where is the next attack going to come from? And of course, against the back, another problem confronting the United States is the rise of China. Here we see a fascinating book by Martin Jacques, who, in spite of his name, is an American, who wrote, When China Rules the World. He's basically saying, Americans, the American century has come to an end about 50 years short of the century. Fasten your seat belts because China is the rising power. Not a welcome vision for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, or for most Americans. Um, this is going to mark the end of the American century. Another major crisis confronting the United States and dominating the um, political campaign are the rise of the BRICS, which means Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These new countries which are emerging, taking more and more economic power, standing up to American domination. We just recently had the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, which was a great celebration of the Brazilian come of age. Vladimir Putin in Russia, expanding his borders, bringing in more Russian people uh, from uh, republics of Ukraine, becoming involved in the Syrian civil war, signing treaties with Iran, uh, India becoming a major economic power, and South Africa, again, the, one of the largest and most ad, uh, rapidly advancing economic powers, which no longer take orders from the United States. They say it is no longer a monopolar world with the United States ruling the world, but it is a multipolar region. And finally, a crisis facing the United States and which is reflected in the campaign is basically the um, economic stagnation in the United States. Yes, we are adding new jobs, as Hillary and President Obama claim, but as Donald Trump points out, these are all jobs at the bottom of the economic scale. The middle class is in crisis. These are the people of the Rust Belt, of Detroit, of Cleveland, of Pittsburgh, Chicago, who are suffering, seeing their paychecks stagnant, if not declining. College graduates who can't find jobs. Law schools, which are closing because there are too many lawyers and not enough jobs. And so you have great success among the top 1% of the population who are growing increasingly richer, but the middle class is declining, the housing crisis where many people lost their homes. So these are the issues which are animating the political campaign. Well, how are the two candidates, now it's down to two, how are the two candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary, confronting this crisis? Whether it is the perceived decline of the United States as a world power, the rise of the world, or whether it is just a general crisis of confidence in the American future. Well, Donald Trump constantly repeats 
that he is the proverbial outsider. He's not a puppet of the Republican Party. And so this vision of himself, this self-perception as the outsider, riding his horse to save America, is central to understanding Donald Trump. Now, stepping back, Donald Trump was not the first person who proclaimed himself an outsider who was going to ride his horse from heaven and save America and the eternal Messiah. The very first presidents of the United States, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, the first six presidents of the United States, basically were either from Massachusetts or Virginia. It was like a ping pong game. George Washington from Virginia was president, then he handed it over to the Adams family from Massachusetts. Thomas Jefferson, Virginia, Madison, Massachusetts. James Monroe, Virginia, another Adams from Massachusetts. The United States, for the first six presidents, was ruled by an aristocratic elite, either Virginia slaveholding plantation owners or successful Boston, Massachusetts businessmen. Well, by the 1820s, the United States was in crisis. It was absorbing millions of European immigrants from Germany, who didn't speak English, and Ireland, who were Catholics. The United States was expanding into vast new territories, such as the Louisiana Purchase, getting ready to go to war against Mexico to steal California and Texas. The United States was in a crisis. Into the scene rides Andrew Jackson, the first president from the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. He was a hillbilly. He did not go to Harvard or to Princeton or to Yale. He was not from the East Coast. He did not speak proper English. He was an orphan from Tennessee, made his fortune in real estate development, was wealthy, but had no East Coast culture. In fact, even before he took the presidency in 1829, he had won the election four years previously. It was stolen from him by John Quincy Adams. Finally, in 1829, he took over the White House. He rode into Washington on his horse as the great Messiah, bringing salvation to the United States. And in fact, he even established his own political party, which continues until today. He is the father of the Democratic Party, rallying new immigrants, rallying farmers from the West, rallying um, factory workers from Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, and Boston. He was the savior of America. Americans loved him. He would go into bar rooms and drink with the worst of them, and he would hand out free shot glasses with his picture on it. He was the first baby-kissing presidential candidate. You could never imagine George Washington going into a bar room and shaking hands, drinking whiskey, and going to family homes and churches and kissing babies. But this was the new style of politics by Andrew Jackson. Once again, plugging into the American myth that America was special, exceptionalism. Don't forget the greatest religious movement of those early 1800s was what we call the Mormons, but don't forget the official name of the Mormon Church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. America is approaching its glorious moment which will usher in the returned Messiah. And this concept of the Messiah riding in from outside to save America is central to understanding the American attitude towards politics. We're always looking for the miracle worker, whether it is a Mahdi in Islam or the Messiah in Judaism or some other savior. That is what Americans are looking for. 
even when I went on Google and checked on images, I came up upon these absolutely um, uh, fascinating portrayals of Donald Trump as the eternal outsider, as the savior. Even the question, is Donald Trump the Messiah? Make America great again. And we see dream Trump mess, okay? So here again, showing Donald Trump with a halo around his head, having a, um, an image of him riding in to save America. And this is really what is the strength of the Donald Trump's campaign. The unemployed factory workers of the Midwest, the factory workers of New York, the middle class seeing their paychecks going down, the young college graduates not able to find a job or saddled with tens of thousands of dollars of college debt. They are powerless. They don't know what to do, so here comes their great savior. This is really the core of Donald Trump's message and his attraction to um, so many Americans. He says, I'm not fighting for Mexico or China. I want to get USA back on track, return to our greatness. And I'm not fighting for Republicans or Democrats. I'm fighting for Americans, all Americans. As is to say, Republican and Democratic parties don't interest me. I have my own party. I have my own identity. I am above politics. I am above uh, ethnic groups, racial groups, even sexual groups. I am the Messiah come to save all people. So his program here is very often filled with myths and wishful thinking such as building the wall with, uh, against, uh, between Mexico and the United States and forcing the Mexicans to pay for it. Of course, it's never going to happen, but this is the dream, the vision of, once again, a triumphant America enclosed in secure walls. Even calling on NATO, saying we don't need NATO. If they don't want to f uh, pay their bills, and carry their burden in defending the West, well then we'll abolish NATO and let them go their own way. We don't need them. God is on our side. Immigration plan, return America to its Christian roots. China, I'm going to bring the jobs back from China. These are much more wishful thinking than they are political platforms. And if you watched the uh, debate last night uh, on American military um, issues, Donald Trump was full of slogans, full of visions and dreams of making America great again, but with almost no concrete platform. Now, Bernie Sanders, who many of us supported, also proclaimed his role as the outsider, where he would say, I am for political revolution. I am a socialist. I am neither Republican nor a Democrat. I am beyond and above politics. And he constantly used the word revolution, revolt against the powers that are established and usher in a new age. And we even see Bernie with his eagle and his American flag, um, not the president we want, but the president we need to save America. And this is the power of the Donald Trump campaign, appealing to people who are in desperate need, in frantic need, of a messiah. Now Hillary Clinton is taking the exact opposite tack. She is the in eternal insider. So here we see a very interesting conflict of world views. The messianic character riding on his horse from the heavens to save us, or 
the person of experience who has proven her mettle as Secretary of State and as a First Lady, here bringing her experience to solve the problem. Ironically, she is the nuts and bolts person who arrives with her toolbox with all of the tools necessary to fix the problems, concrete solutions, not visions from the heavens, but reality. And so even her slogan is fighting for us, meaning fighting for Americans. She's the fighter. She's not going to come in, wave her magic wand, and solve all of the problems. Fighting for us means we have a battle to do. If she is in the White House, she's going to rally supporters. They are going to solve in a concrete way um, the problems facing us. But she also plugs into uh, the nationalism uh, element, which Donald Trump is very strong on, where another one of her campaign slogans is Hillary for America. Once again, it's the nationalism that we see in Donald Trump. It's make America great again. Going back to the golden age, the American century of Henry Luce, which is so powerfully suffusing the entire political campaign, whether it is Democrat or Republican. Hillary cannot escape this um, rising nationalism that so inspires Donald Trump. Her main emphasis in the campaign is she is eminently qualified. No one who has ever run for the presidency is more qualified than Hillary Clinton. Now, yes, she is qualified as Secretary of State, but the attacks against her coming from Donald Trump and other people are precisely for what happened in Libya. Was she qualified? Did she handle it well? Did she handle her whole email situation using a non-approved server? Does this qualify her? Does it undermine her presidency? With Donald Trump, we don't see these attacks on his qualifications because basically he has none. And so there's not much of a political record to attack. But when Hillary emphasizes her qualifications, that is something that can be undermined. It can be questioned. And I'm just waiting for a, a, a shattering revelation to come out, maybe in the days just before the election. Because don't forget, someone, very often it's rumored to be the Russians, uh, infiltrated and uh, hacked into the Democratic campaign uh, emails, which means there are thousands of emails floating around in somebody's computer waiting to be revealed. And that, I think, is really the biggest danger facing Hillary, where uh, just a couple days before the election, there could be a massive release of documents further undermining her claim to be the most qualified uh, candidate for the um, presidency. And here again, we see Hillary Clinton for the Democratic nomination, okay, most broadly and deeply qualified presidential candidate in modern history. Once again, this is her claim, but it is also a, uh, a weak point if more revelations should be made. Her career as Secretary of State from 2009 to 2013, her job on the Council for Foreign Relations, her, um, her, um, her role in National Clean Energy Summit, um, uh, uh, 7.0, and her other professional activities have qualified her. When we look at the president's um, uh, comparing um, 
other presidents who have come into the White House, she is probably one of the most qualified. When we look at President Obama, he had almost no national qualifications other than a senator from Illinois and work in Chicago. Ronald Reagan had no qualifications for president. So when Hillary comes in and claims she is qualified, she has the background, she has the experience to confront all of the problems which are facing the United States and the world and especially the, on her role in the Council on Foreign Relations and as Secretary of State dealing with foreign leaders. Just recently Donald Trump went to Mexico where he had meetings with President Nieto in uh, Mexico City as a way of giving himself some international qualifications. Well that seems to have uh, blown up in his face because President Nieto is uh, rock bottom popularity in Mexico and the people who invited um, Donald Trump are, being, are fleeing the Nieto government. But still we see Donald Trump attempting to show that he does have some qualifications. A major uh, attack on Hillary has come from her use of emails and in a way her inability to put this issue behind her. And here again I think there are more revelations to come which could emerge uh, in the days just before the um, election. And here we see Fox News which is no great supporter of Hillary but it said her quotes are, I did not email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material where she said, uh, and it says, Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State. Once again attacking her qualifications. Uh, the New York Post, deleter of the free world, where here she admits that she revealed 30,000 emails. And those are explosive emails, potentially explosive. Who knows what's in them, but I fear that somebody does know who's in them and will start revealing them shortly before the election. The whole situation in Benghazi. Once again, when you have a political record, you are subject to attacks. Donald Trump has no political record, which more or less makes him immune from attacks on his uh, policy. Where here we see the five facts about Hillary and Benghazi. She ignored security requests for aid to come to the aid of the embassy which is under attack. She intentionally cut security. She lied about a video. She silenced witnesses and she lied to Congress. Here again we see that the whole situation in Benghazi, which she handled as Secretary of State, is exposing her to uh, weaknesses. And she doesn't help it when she very often contradicts herself. Here we see she lied about a video. She lied to Congress. She would probably deny that she lied, but here again that is weakening her as a president. And once again, weakening her claims to be the most qualified person to restore American greatness and to confront the world problems. And so here we see Benghazi still matters and you can be sure that the Republicans are never going to allow it to disappear. Now Hillary as definitely making a campaign to be the president for Democrats, Republicans, independents, for the struggling, the striving, and the successful, for those who vote for me and for those who don't, for all Americans. And here we see the slogan, humanity for Hillary. The central plank of Hillary's campaign is the appeal to the diversity of Americans, whether it is African Americans, who support her strongly. Although Donald Trump has been making a major outreach to African Americans, but I think Hillary and especially the Clinton clan uh, 
the African Americans have remained very loyal to them. Hispanics, seems as Donald Trump has done everything he can to alienate them, and especially the wall with Mexico. So she has very strong support among Hispanics. New immigrants, especially Muslims and Africans, Asians, Chinese, are strongly in support of Hillary for the simple reason that Donald Trump's, Trump is alienating them. Gays and lesbians strongly support Hillary, as they did Bill, and they have a long history of um, supporting them. Women largely support Hillary. Once again, Donald Trump has seemed to have done everything possible to alienate women, and he's had very little luck in attracting them. And workers, so-called blue-collar workers, who uh, tend to support Hillary because of their work in the unions. So Hillary does have her strength. Uh, as does um, Donald Trump. So that's why I say that the election which is coming up now is the most important presidential election in American history. The world is an exciting place. A lot is happening in this day and age. In fact, one of my students yesterday at my class at Toro said, well, Professor, you teach history. If you had to choose an age that you would want to live through, what age would that be? Well, of course, they were thinking Roman Empire, the Renaissance, or something like that. Well, I looked at him and I said, my God, today, when you look at what is happening in the world, is the United States still the, still the major superpower? Are we a declining power? Look at all the books being written about the Roman Empire, the decline and fall of the British Empire, the rise of China after a, almost a thousand years of being the sleeping dragon. It is now on the verge of overtaking the United States as the number one economic power. Immigration. Is the United States going to remain the melting pot of world societies? Are we going to be, as the Statue of Liberty proclaims, a resting place for the weary and the troubled and the exiled? Is the United States going to enjoy its American century? The rise of Brazil and India and Russia Countries like uh, Indonesia are on the march. What is the future going to bring? All right, I'm 67. Uh, I'm going to see a couple more decades. But young people, when they see the future ahead of them, they should be watching these uh, debates. They should be tuning in and saying, what is their future going to be? I just hope that whoever's in power, Trump or Hillary, that Social Security will stay solvent. The American dollar will remain strong to get me through to my retirement and future years. But for young people, this is a crucial era. Now, beginning on September 26, we have the very first presidential debate. This is going to be a powerful confrontation between the two, and it may very well determine who wins the um, presidency or not. So mark your calendar, September 26 followed by a town hall meeting on October 9th and the second big debate on October 19th. These are very important debates, and even if you've had a bit much of politicking already, uh, between now and November, the fate of the United States and the world might just very well be determined. 